So, so the question, of course, the question is, if I, am I, what is the limits of how, what, what I can do to defend my property? In other words, simple question, could you defend your property with deadly force? Somebody comes into your house at night during the day, you kill him. Is that okay? Is that allowed? Is it not allowed? And the big picture is going to be that it seems that the Torah is some, saying something similar to what the secular law says. So it seems on, 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 on first glance. But upon deeper analysis, you realize Torah is saying something completely different, which means it's based on a completely different value. And therefore, the ramifications of when the law applies and how the law applies are different. So, like I said, on the surface, it seems like it seems like it's uh, it seems like it's the same, but it's not. So, what's the idea? So, the first thing. So, I have the handout. There's the cases. We'll go through all of this. But the big picture, the, the big picture is like this. There's this, there's this, the secular laws um, doctrine. It's not just America, European countries. It's based on what they call the castle doctrine, and the idea is that your home is like your castle. What does it mean your home is like a castle? I know it sounds uh, medieval, but that's what it is. That's where it started. The idea is what happens if somebody comes to me in the street and, want, and wants to start a fight? Can I kill him? The answer is no. Okay, let's start from the beginning. You can always say self-defense. If, if you feel threatened, you can always kill the person in self-defense. And if you ever get into trouble, if you ever kill somebody coming into your house, I don't suggest you do, but if you ever do, a good lawyer will say, okay, say it's self-defense. But let's assume it's not self-defense. Let's say somebody comes up to you in the street and says, give me your wallet. Could I pull out my gun and shoot them? Or do I have to give them my wallet? That's, that, that's the question. In other words, yeah, I could defend myself if my life is in danger, but what happens if my life is not in danger? At what point do I have to, do I have to give over my possessions or at what point do I say, I'm protecting myself and I'm gonna use deadly force to, to, to stop you from robbing me, for example. So. Again, in this country, it's very different. Every state is different. But the, the castle doctrine as idea is, in this scenario, where somebody would come and say, give me your wallet, you cannot kill the person because you can use force. What are you supposed to do? Either give the wallet or what they call retreat. Somebody confronts you, walk away. Nobody asks you, you don't have to be the macho. You don't have to win the fight. Whereas worse comes to worse, you'll retreat. You just get far like you're saying, Yiddish, it's not the end of the world. Point is here, I retreat, retreat, retreat. Retreat to where? Retreat to my castle, retreat home. But if you're coming into my home and you say, um, I wanna rob you, I wanna take your TV, I wanna take your piano, doesn't matter what it is. Now the question is, what do I do? So the doctrine says, you don't have a duty to retreat. You don't have to retreat, why? You're in your home, there's no reason to retreat from your home. You have to retreat to your home. But if you're in your home, you don't have to retreat. And if you don't have to retreat, you could use deadly force to keep to defend yourself and your property in your house if it's in your house because it's your castle. That is the basic idea. And again, in different states, it works differently because now that we have all those the stories that came into the press over the last 10 years, many people are much more familiar with the laws now. And there are states that say, I think Florida is one of them, they call it stand your ground. Stand your ground laws expands this idea. They say, well, you never have to retreat. Somebody comes up to you in Florida and says, give me your wallet. You can put out your gun, you can shoot them. Why? They don't have to retreat. It's called stand your ground. Texas is like that. But most, let's, let, we're not talking about that. Let's talk about the castle doctrine per se, because again, it sounds a little bit like, like what the Torah is gonna say. And, 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 that's, and, and that's what we wanna discuss. Okay, so what's the problem, so to speak, with the castle doctrine? What's the, what's the ethical moral problem? Potentially, it sounds like my, my TV is more important than your life, right? You're the thief. You break into my house. Am I allowed to protect? Am I allowed to kill you to protect my, my, my possessions? So yeah, I don't have to retreat. I like it. If you, if you, if you like it, that castle doctrine, and you say, I, I don't have to move. Okay, but is that, is that a problem? Is that, is, are you telling me that I'm allowed to kill somebody, even if he's a thief? But again, the thief, there's no, there's no capital punishment for a thief, right? The thief is a thief. Um, at least in the Torah, there isn't. In the ancient law, there was. There were, it, was, it was all felonies were capital crimes. But from, from the moral perspective, does that sound right? The guy walks into my house and says, look, I don't want to harm you. I just like your, your Apple computer. Give me your Apple computer. I'll go home. Or give me your jewelry, whatever it is. I say, no, I'm in my castle. I'm in my castle. Get out of here. Don't get out of here. I shoot you. 
Is that, is that okay? Is that moral? Is that the right thing to do? So the castle doctrine says, yes, no problem, because you have the right to come into, you have the, you have, you have the obligation to retreat if it happened in the streets, but if it happens in your, but if it happens in your house, if it happens in your house, you have no duty to retreat, you can use deadly force to defend yourself. This is the idea of castle doctrine. This is sort of, a, I'm raising a potentially ethical problem. And um, then we're going to get to see what the, what the Torah says, what the Talmud says, what the post what the commentaries say, namely Rambam and Ravid, Maimonides and Ravid, who's Rabbi Abraham ben David, who wrote comments on the work of, of Rambam. So this is the story in short so far, introduction. Any questions, comments, please share. Otherwise, we take a dive straight into the Torah and then the Gemara and then the Rambam. Well, Rabbi, I have a comment based on the recent event yeah. uh, with Shlomo Naginsky. Um, so I don't know if you heard it was in Russian, the, um, the interview. So what, what happened was he, he was outside of the school, of the, of the camp, right? Yeah. And, and the guy was, he was armed. The guy was armed, but Shlomo didn't know that. So um, he basically, the... Um, uh, that perpetrator, he basically um, demanded him to go to the car. Yeah. So Shlomo immediately showed him the car keys. So he's a Talmudic scholar, right? So if you want my car, just get the car. But the guy wasn't happy with that. He wanted Shlomo in the car, right? And he started attacking him. So the next step he takes exactly as the Talmud said, he started to try to retreat, right. running. But the guy was probably younger and stronger. So he finally, finally caught him and the guy was armed. So I have a problem with the retreat. So, so how do you terrible. retreat? How do you retreat and you don't know whether the, the person is armed or not? In that case, in the case that you, that you spell out, if he had a weapon, if the rabbi had a weapon, he could clearly defend himself. And he can clearly say that it's clearly a quick question of self-defense and self-defense is always the moral thing. The question would be in a case that's different, in the case where the guy says, give me your, give me your, your keys, I don't wanna harm you. All I want is your keys, I like the model of your car. You have a very nice car, can I have your car? And in that case, if the rabbi had a weapon and killed the thief, would that be the moral, would that be, would that be okay? Well, legally and morally. But, no, no, I, I understand, but you never know whether he's exactly. armed. Okay, good point. Right? Good, and, good. And, and, Rabbi, and Rabbi wasn't armed, he knew that for sure. Right. So good point. You have you could make a good point, which is in some cases, I don't know whether my life is in danger. Excellent point. And therefore, my suggestion to you, I'm not a lawyer, but my suggestion to you is that if you ever get into trouble, say, I thought my life was in danger. And if I'm, this is between the two of us. And if you say, I thought my life was in danger, chances are most likely you'll be safe. In other words, the law, you won't be prosecuted because you're right, you're right. It's a very difficult thing. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know that, you're, that, that if you're in danger and if you act and you say, in my mind, I thought I was in danger, you're safe. But now, when I'm talking a little more theoretical and you'll, you're gonna see that I'm, it's not just theoretical because once we get to the Talmud, there's going to be clear ramifications and the castle doctrine starts shifting. You're going to, it's fascinating how the subtlety in the philosophical points makes a real big difference in the practical, in the practical sense. So, so we'll see. So in other words, let's come back to this in exactly one half hour at 12.45. And at 12.45, let's come back to the question and we'll see if, 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 we, if we make any progress. Okay, go ahead. Which Parsha is this connected to? I know we talk about this with the Parsha. Oh, we may have talked about it, but now we know then the depth. It's called Mishpatim. In Mishpatim, in the okay. law of, in the Parsha of Mishpatim, it talks about these verses are from. So this is the, the civil law. Thank you. Yeah, so we discussed it and I even wrote about it, but that was just... Surface, yeah. Well, no, it's the essential point, but to see how it, how it applies and how... The yeah. various opinions of the Talmud will change the result in various scenarios and how to compare it to what happens um, in the modern perspective is, I think, is fascinating. So here we go. We jump right in, sharing the screen. You guys have it. I'm skipping the beginning. 
I'm skipping. So we did the Carousel Doctrine. Connecticut law is interesting for those who live in Connecticut. Um, we'll get back to the Connecticut law in a minute. Okay, Torah. What does the Torah say? If the thief is discovered while tunneling, breaking in, and he is struck and dies, he has no blood. If the sun shone upon him, he has blood. A very, uh, very, uh, a little bit cryptic verse, even though it's cryptic for us, but in the language of biblical Hebrew, it's not cryptic. It's clear, has no blood means he has no guilt. If I kill someone who has no blood, it means I didn't kill a human being. I killed someone who does not deserve, does not have the protection of a human being. So in other words, the Torah says as follows. The thief is discovered while tunneling into my house and he is struck and dies. That's okay, he has no blood. The person who killed the thief while, while tunneling in has no blood. Um, so therefore the, the person who kills the thief is not guilty of, uh, of murder. If the sun shone upon him, which is a strange expression, we'll get to what that means. Then he, the thief, he has blood. The thief does have blood. Meaning to say, if the thief then, um, if I kill the thief when the sun is shining, then the thief has blood and I'm guilty for killing someone who has blood. So that's the little chart here. What does it mean? If he has no blood, it means he has no blood means he's not, I'm not guilty of killing someone without blood. If the sun, sun shone upon him, we will see what the Talmud says and then we'll see what, how the rivet learns it. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's the Gemara, which you... Um, um, we discussed it. So you probably heard of it because we discussed it in the Parsha. Rava said, what is the reason for the law of breaking in, of tunneling in? Because it is certain that no man is inactive where his property is concerned. Therefore, this one, the thief, must have reasoned, if I go there, the owner will oppose me and prevent me. But if he does, I will kill him. Hence the Torah decreed, if someone comes to kill you, anticipate him and kill him first. This is a very famous Talmudic line. Habala hargacha, someone who comes to kill you. Hashkem lahargah, here they translate anticipate him. Literally, it's even more poetic. Wake up early and kill him first. In other words, take a preemptive act. Don't wait till the guy is hitting you on the head. You have to take a preemptive act to defend him. That's Talmud tractates and Hedman page 72. What is the Talmud saying here? What's Rava saying here? Rava is saying something very, very interesting. And the reason why I think it's so interesting because one of the reasons it's so interesting is because it's some, saying something completely different than the castle doctrine, even though in some cases, the result will, of the law will be the same, but philosophically, it's a completely different point. And therefore, um, and therefore, like I said, there are gonna be cases where the, the, it's different, it, the, the result would differ from what this castle doctrine in American law would say or Connecticut law would say. So what is Rava saying? Rava is saying a very interesting point. I asked you a question before about the castle doctrine. Does this mean that your TV is more important than the thief's life? And the castle doctrine would say, in some cases, yes. I could defend my property with deadly force because you have no business, the thief has no business coming into my house. And if he does, I don't have to retreat. I could defend my property. Me defending my property is just as important, uh, is just as valuable as the other thief's life. And therefore I can kill the thief. That's what the castle doctrine says, which is the foundation of the secular law, which is why you'll see that they line a line. What does the Talmud say? Rava says, make no mistake. That is not what the verse is saying. What is the verse saying? The verse saying is something saying comes completely something is saying com something completely different. Rava says that what the verse is saying, if somebody enters your home, tunnels into your home, that is an act of aggression. That is an act. He is prepared to use force against you, and therefore you're allowed to kill him. Not so much because you're defending your property but because this guy is prepared to kill you if you're gonna defend your property. So he is ready to escalate. And because he's ready to escalate, you don't have to wait until he actually escalates. You can act preemptively and you could, and you could, and you could kill him. In other words, it's similar to the castle doctrine in the sense that the Torah says, I don't have to retreat. Yeah, I don't have to retreat. But why do I get to kill that other guy? Why does he have no blood? 
because he's coming from my TV? No, he has no blood because he knows that I am gonna naturally, a person wants to defend their property. If he comes anyway, knowing that I'm here and he wants to defend my, and he wants to defend his property and he, and, and he knows that I'm gonna defend that property, he knows that I'm here, he's obviously willing to escalate. If he's willing to escalate, he's willing to use violence against me, I then are able to, and therefore perhaps should, um, preempt, act preemptively and strike him first. So that is um, what the Talmud says. And now we're gonna show how different, it, how it's different than the castle doctrine. And therefore we're gonna show how, the, how that difference will play out in many different scenarios. So here's the chart. Oh, it's, two, it's on two different part, 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 parts of the page, it doesn't work. What, summary, why is the homeowner in some cases permitted to use deadly force? Castle doctrine, because I'm allowed to defend my castle. That's the philosophical principle here. I'm allowed to defend my, I'm allowed to defend my, my property. And therefore, if someone comes into my house, I can kill him. To take my stuff, I can kill him. What does the Torah say? Torah says it has nothing to do with defending property. I mean, it does have what to do. The premise of this idea is not defending property. The premise of this idea is if that guy comes into my house knowing that I'm home, obviously he's willing to use violence because he expects me to try to stop him. And if he doesn't, um, if he doesn't, and, and therefore, and therefore I don't have to wait for him to use violence, I could go and I could use violence first. So go back to Fega's case. The guy comes up to the rabbi and says, give me the keys to your car. I don't wanna harm you. Just give me the keys to your car and I'll let you go home and have a nice day. Rava says, it's not the castle doctrine as you'll see in a minute, there's no castle here. Rava says, you could take out your gun. I think, well, uh, well according to some opinions, we'll get, everything is, uh, you'll see in a minute, the opinions change. But according to, according to the simple interpretation of, Ram, of, of the Talmud, certainly according to Rambam, I'm allowed to take out my gun and shoot the guy between the eyes. Why? He's not here, He's, he doesn't want my life. He's not putting me in danger. He just wants my property. But the Rabbah is saying, no, no such thing. Someone comes up to you and asks for your, and, and demands your property. He knows that you're gonna prepare to defend your property. And therefore, if he came up to you, he is willing to escalate. And if he's willing to escalate, you don't know. We don't know for sure, but you don't know. You have to assume if the guy's approaching you for your property, he's willing to escalate. And if he's willing to escalate, you don't have to wait for him to pull out the gun first. Habala harvecha, someone's coming to get you. Hashkin maharga, wake up early and kill him. So according to the Rambam, at least as we will see, if a guy comes up to, my, to me for my car keys, I can shoot him. You'll see in a minute, Raiva disagrees. But you see how the, how the castle doctrine would say, no, you have to retreat because it's not your castle. And you'll see in a minute that uh, even the state, okay, well, there's a lot to say here, but how does that, how does that sound? Does that make sense what I said, Vicki, in response to your question? Right, it, it does, but I had, a, I had a practical question. In those times, do they have, what, how would they kill the, the thief? Or do you, they have, did, they didn't have guns, right? What if the thief has had better weapons? If like, like, has better weapons, you better call security, you better run for your life. But the point here is, you don't, we're not saying you should. Remember, it doesn't say if the guy's tumbling into your house, you should kill him. It doesn't say that. Should you, should you not, it doesn't say. It's your judgment. We can't tell you every scenario is different. What we do say, if you kill him, you're not guilty. Because by the fact that that guy comes into your house knowing that you're there, assuming that you're there, it means he's prepared to use force. But he didn't escalate. It doesn't matter he didn't escalate. He's prepared to escalate. And therefore, if I kill him, I'm not guilty. Should I kill him? Maybe you should retreat. Maybe it depends. We can't tell you what to do in every scenario. Are there other people there? Could you call for help? How long does it take for the police to respond? You get a million scenarios. So we can't tell you what to do. You have to use your judgment. But we could say, if that guy approached you and he, know, and he wants your possessions, and Rava's principle is that the human nature is to defend your possessions. So that guy is prepared to escalate. If he's prepared to escalate and I kill him, he has no blood. Doesn't say kill him, just he has no blood, which means if I kill him, I'm not guilty.
Okay, the journey continues. We have to first deal with this a technical issue, which is what does it mean if the sun shone upon him? Uh, so we'll read the Gemara. If the sun shines upon him, then he has blood. In other words, if the guy is tunneling into my castle and the sun shines upon him, whatever we don't know what that means, then he has blood, which means if I kill him, I'm guilty. What does it mean if the sun shines upon him? Now the Gemara asks it in a very and very uh, 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 literary way. Now, did the sun rise upon him alone? The verse says, if the sun shines upon him, meaning on the thief. What does that mean? The sun doesn't shine upon the thief. The sun shines upon everybody. So that's what the Gemara says. Did the sun rise upon him alone? Okay. So, so, so that obviously, this is metaphoric. Because if it was not metaphoric, if it was literal, if it would say, if the sun shines. If the Talmud wants to say that this law applies only at night, not in the, begin not in the daytime, the Talmud would have said, if the sun shines, that's all. But since the Talmud says, if the sun shines upon him, which is strange because the sun shines upon everybody, that tells us that this law, this verse is non-literal, it's figurative. What does it mean? It means if it is as clear to thee, to thee, to thee, to thy, as the sun, that his intentions are peaceable, do not slay him, otherwise slay him. We're saying, if you know for sure that that guy is not going to kill you, you can't kill him. If you're not sure, go ahead and kill him. This is actually funny. The next piece of Talmud is actually funny or sad, depending on your perspective. Rob said, any man who broke into my house, I would kill. In other words, I don't, I don't know if you're going to kill me. Maybe you're just here for my TV. But I would kill anybody because I'm not sure. Except for Rav Hanina Bar Shiva. Why? Shall we say because he is righteous and therefore certain not to kill me? Surely he has broken in. So he obviously is not righteous but because I am assured that he would have pity on me like a father for his son. In other words, he says, if I know somebody loves me so much that he won't kill me, I can't kill him. Otherwise, he could, he, otherwise I could kill him because I'm not sure. By the way, what I said was funny was the next piece of Talmud, which, which I didn't copy here, which says, if a child breaks into the parent's home, the parent could kill the child. Meaning to say, there's no assurance that the child won't kill the parents to get the to get the TV, but if the but 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 if a father breaks into the child, if a parent breaks into the child, the child cannot kill the parents because there's no way that the parent would kill the child, and that's what the Talmud says. The case of if the sun shines upon you is ben is avala ben the father, meaning parent break into the child's home, the child cannot kill the father because we assume, of course there are exceptions, but we assume the father is not gonna kill you. Rav is expanding it. It's either a father to a child, parent to a child, or even someone that I know loves me so much. For example, was in that case, Rav, was Rav Hanina Bar Shiva. He loves me like a, like a parent to a child. But, um, so that's the case, so that's, that, so that's the limitation. The limitation is that if you know for sure, or you assume, we assume that there's no way the guy's gonna kill you, you cannot kill him first. Now, I'm only bringing this in because you will see later that this question is not so simple and there are, there, the Ravid uses this and, 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 uh, and strongly limits the law, the protection to kill, the right to kill, but we'll get to that in a minute. Next piece of Talmud, which is also relevant to, 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 the, to, the, to figure everything out here. The problem is like this. The problem is that the verse says a case of someone is machteret. Literally, machteret means tunneling in. We assume it means tunneling into a home. Now the question becomes, what happens if it's not in a home? What happens if it's in my courtyard? What happens if it's anywhere else? The question is, the question is, um, the question is, what, what, is it specific to a home or in other places as well? Now, by the way, the castle doctrine says, it's specific to a home. Because for example, even your place of business, according to some states like in New York, your place of business, your, your, the castle doctrine does not apply. Why? It's not, your, it's, not your, it's not your castle. And there are other ramifications. We'll get to that. It's absolutely fascinating. So here we go. Our rabbis taught, if the thief be found tunneling in, that's the verse, if the thief is found tunneling in, Says the Talmud, from this I know that the Lord only for tunneling in through the wall. 
Whence do we know if he is be found on the roof in a court or in an enclosure attached to the house? It's not my house, it's my garage. From the verse, if the thief be found, implying wherever he is found as thief. In other words, Talmud says, don't get caught up with Bamachteret in the tunnel, which means tunneling into a home. It means the broader, the next verse said, in the next word says, you must say, if you must say Haganab, if the thief was tunneling and is found. So focus on the word that's found. Found is broader, found is anywhere. If so, why stay tunneling? Because most thieves enter by tunneling in. In other words, what this Baraisa is doing is saying, don't get caught up. It's not literally tunneling into a home. It really is broader than that. Really, it's any place that the thief will be found. That's what the verse says. If the thief will be found, tunneling in. So tunneling in means tunneling into a home. It's very limited. But the, bright, the, the, the Talmud explains that, no, we're talking about, you have to broaden it. It means you might say anywhere that the thief will be found, um, not, limited to, not limited to the home. So why does it say tunneling in? It's just an example. The Torah uses an example that's common, and most people will come in through a tunnel. Another brighter taught, if a thief is found tunneling in, from this I know the law only for tunneling in. Whence do I know if he be found on the roof or in the court or in an enclosure? From the verse, if the thief be found, implying wherever he is found, found as thief. If so, why stay tunneling in? Because the tunneling in constitutes a formal warning. This is a diff same question, different answer. This bright does says something very interesting. Again, it's going to be relevant to later when we apply the law, practically speaking. There's a problem here. The problem is that in Jewish law, you always have to warn before there's a punishment. I cannot um, uh, um, kill somebody without a formal warning. The court cannot kill somebody without a formal warning. You're not guilty of any bodily, uh, you know, of any bodily, of, um, of any corporal punishment, not just, not just capital punishment, but even any corporal punishment. You're not guilty unless you're warned. So the Talmud is addressing the issue here is, um, we're, the Talmud here is addressing the issue is, where do I, where was this guy warned? The thief broke in, he wants my TV. I can't just kill him, I have to warn him. The Talmud says, no, 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 he doesn't have to be warned, why not? The act of tunneling in means he wasn't warned, but why do you have to warn someone? You have to warn, some to make, warn someone to make sure that he is not doing it by mistake, that it's premeditated, right? So the act of tunneling in, it's clearly premeditated. And therefore it's clearly on purpose and therefore he doesn't have to be warned or in the language of the Talmud, the act of tunneling in constitutes the formal warning. So in other words, what we're saying here, what we're adding here and you'll see, we'll see in a minute how, this, how, how, how it applies when we apply it practically, we wanna make sure that this thief, before we can kill the thief, what the Talmud is adding here, so actually we just had two pieces of Talmud. The first piece of Talmud broadened the law. It's not just tunneling into a home, but it's also courtyard, and it's also your garage, and it's also your storage house. We're broadening it, because we're saying the word you might say will be found is broadening it, and it includes every case. And why does it say tunneling in? That's just the, that's just the common case, but that's not the only case. So the first piece of Talmud broadens the law. The second piece of Talmud narrows the law. How so? We say, you have to make sure that this is premeditated. And tunneling in is, premed is premeditated. If it's a case that's not premeditated or not as premeditated, you may not be able to kill the guy as we will see when we get to the right, as we'll see later. Okay, so far so good. We finished the Talmud. Now we have to move to, to, to Rambam. But so far so good, right? Any questions, comments, jokes? Disagreements, otherwise we continue. Okay. So now we have Rambam. We're going to go to Allah 7. I forget which chapter it should have said here. Does it say it here? Doesn't yet. Yeah. Chapters 9 of Hilchas Kneva, the laws of theft. Here we go, chapter 7. When a person breaks into a home, whether at night or during the day. Oh, very important, right? How do we know it's whether or night or, 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 or during the day? We'll see later others disagree because we just learned in the Talmud that that when it says you can't kill him when the sun shines upon him, it's not, it doesn't mean in the morning. It doesn't mean you can't kill someone in the morning. It just means if you're not, if you're sure that he's not going to kill you. So therefore, my monody says whether or night during or, or during the day, license is granted to kill him. It doesn't say you have to kill him. If you could, he has no blood. 
if either the homeowner or another person kills him, they are not liable. This is absolutely fascinating because the castle doctrine says, you ready? The castle doctrine says, the only way you're allowed to kill the guy breaking in is if it's your house. And some states, or at least if you have permission to be here. And some states, they actually say, how do I know if, how do I know if it's my house? Let's say I'm staying at your house. How do I know if it's considered my house? So there was a case in New York where the jury, the, where the jury was told by the judge, it has to be the guy, the guy that killed the thief. They said, the guy that killed the thief, you have to make sure that he had clothing in the house. That, in, in, in the house. Oh, I stepped at your house for a night. My, my shirt has to hang in your closet. You know, it has to literally be my house. Why? Not literally, either my house or at least I have permission to be here. Why? Because that's the logic of the law. The logic of the law is I have the right to protect my castle, but it's my castle. I have to live here. It has to be my castle. But according to, to, to Torah, as Maimonides points and highlights this, the Talmud doesn't say it explicitly, but Rambam points out, he says, one second, if I happen to be in Vicky's house for whatever reason, and somebody breaks in, that guy is prepared to use violence against me. If he's prepared to use violence against me, I can kill him. It doesn't really matter whether or not it's my house or not. And therefore the Talmud says, either the homeowner or another person kills him. Because let's say I'm in Vicky's house, someone breaks in, and I wanna protect Vicky from the intruder. There's no castle doctrine here. It's not my castle. New York law would say, I can't kill the intruder. Vicky can, I can't. I mean, Vicky, I, I could if I think it's not, I'm saving her life. But just to protect from the TV, I can't. It's not my, it's, it's not my house. But well, the Talmud says, no, no, no. Talmud says anybody, the Talmud doesn't say it, but Maimonides derives from the Talmud that since we're not talking about a castle doctrine, here the point is if the thief breaks in means he's prepared to use violence. So if someone's prepared to use violence, he's prepared to use deadly force, anybody has the obligation to defend against this guy. And that's why he says either the homeowner or another person kills him. Fascinating. The license to kill him applies both on Shabbat and during the week. That's another discussion why that's significant. We won't get into it right now, otherwise we'll never fill it, finish. One may kill in any passable manner. This is all implied by Exodus 22.1, which literally reads, he has no blood. Now, we're expanding it. Unlike Castle Doctrine, which says it only applies to a house, and even, I, I, I don't have time to sort of go through it, we'll go through it later. In the state of Connecticut, I think it applies to your place of business also, but not, but not in New York. The Rambam says, we're applying it to everything. Halacha 12, similarly, a person who breaks into a garden, field, or pen, or coral may, may not be killed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. For the prevailing presum presumption is that he came merely to steal money. For generally, the owners are not found in such places. This is absolutely fascinating and also very different than the castle doctrine. What happens if a thief breaks into a place where we assume the owner is not there? So a field, I have a pen of chickens, I have a place where I keep my animals. The owner is usually not there. The thief breaks into my a stable and wants to steal my best horse. The castle doctrine says, it's your stable, it's part of your house, it's part of your house. There's no duty to retreat, you can kill the guy. Rambam says, one second, you can't kill him. Why not? Because the thief did not assume that you're gonna be there. If he did not assume that you're gonna be there, there's no pr presumption that he was prepared to use force against you. If there is no presumption that he's gonna use force against you, you can't pre preempt him and kill him unless, unless you see, unless you're afraid that he's gonna kill you or unless there's some indication that he's gonna kill you. But just because he broke into your field or broke into your pen or broke into a place where you're not, where you're not found, so then you can't kill him. And this is 11 is also very limited. They're also very limiting of the law, which is absolutely fascinating, halacha 11. Different rules apply with regard to a thief who stole and departed, or one who did not steal, but was caught leaving the tunnel through which he entered the home. Since he turned his back on the house and is no longer intent on killing its owner, he may not be slain. If the guy's turning around, the thief is turning around, he's not here, he's leaving, he's on the way out. If he's on the way out, I can't kill him. Similarly, if he is surrounded by other people or by witnesses, he may not be killed even if he is still located within the domain which he broke into. Needless to say, if he is brought to the court, he may not be killed. In other words, the whole point here is that we assume, I can kill him if we assume that he wants to, that he's gonna be aggressive and he's willing to escalate. But if 
he is on the way out or turned his back, he's not necessarily willing to escalate, you may not kill him. And we still have to do the rivals. Okay, we have another five minutes to, 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 to read, and then I'm gonna try to summarize. But I'm gonna write to Ravid. Who was the Ravid? The Ravid was a great commentator, a great, great sage in, in uh, time of Maimonides. He was a little bit older than Maimonides. He wrote comments on the book of Maimonides. He disagreed with Maimonides in many places, but it's known that uh, it was actually considered a great honor that he wrote comments on the book of Maimonides because that was basically an endorsement of all the other places that he didn't really disagree with Maimonides and also an endorsement to his book, which was controversial at the time. So he was a great sage. What does Ravid say? Ravid is an acronym from Rabbi Abraham Ben David. So he writes as follows. I will not refrain from writing my opinion. Although our sages interpreted the verse, if the sun shone upon him to mean, if it, if, if it is, should be, if it is as clear as the sun, um, that he did not come to kill, etc. Nevertheless, the, the, the verse should not be taken out of its literal meaning. Um, this should go, right? It's literal meaning. Therefore, there's no permission to kill during the day because during the day, the thief is taking a chance. The thief is taking a chance and he plans to run away immediately and does not intend to steal great value and does not intend to kill the homeowner. And the thief is just trying his luck. The thief who comes at night, by contrast, knows that the homeowner is home and he's prepared to kill or be killed. So the arrival is saying a few points here, very interesting. First, first legally, and then, and then, and then, uh, and then it gives the reason. So the Talmud says that the sun shining upon you doesn't mean literally. It, it means that you can kill someone who you know is not going to kill you, but it doesn't mean literally. But the arrival it says, no, it also means literally. What the, what, 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 the, what the Talmud is doing is saying, it's not only that you can't kill someone during the day, but it's also if it's, you, if it's someone that you know for sure is not going to kill you, even if he comes at night, he can't, you can't kill him. In other words, the Ravid, to keep it short, the Ravid is still saying that during the day, you cannot kill an intruder. Why? The castle voucher makes no sense. What's the difference if it's a day at night or at night? So what the Ravid is saying is based on what I said earlier, that the act of tunneling in is the warning. In other words, when somebody walks by a house during the day, the door's open, the door's left open. He says, you know what? I'm going to peek my head in. I'm going to grab a wallet and see, maybe I'll run up. He's not necessarily um, 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 premeditated to the point where he's agreed to use force. He's just trying his luck. However, at night, when the doors are closed and everybody is home and it takes great effort to get in and you know that the owner is home, there, it's much more premeditated. In other words, the driver is saying that there's like that, that, that if the guy just walks by you and says, okay, give me your wallet, it's not necessarily you can, you can apply it. You can apply it in the same way. Okay, let's do some summaries here just to make, just to make sense of this at all. According to Maimonides, can one kill an intruder who entered a store at 2 a.m.? No. No, why not? Because the, the because, because because the homeowner is not home, because he's not expecting the homeowner to be home, and therefore he's not, he's, we have no indication that he's here to use, to use force. Can one kill an intruder who entered a home at 2 a.m.? Yes, because the owner is home. He assumed, we assume the owner is home, which means, which triggers this law that we assume the guy is home, so we assume that the intruder is prepared to use force. Okay, we did the rivet. Let's, let, now we're gonna try to summarize everything, but first we'll read the Connecticut law. Let's read the Connecticut law. Connecticut law, the Castle Doctrine is incorporated into Connecticut law governing the use of physical force in defense of premises. This law states that a person who possesses or controls a premises, that's the point I said earlier, it has to be Vicky, because you possess or control your house, or is licensed or privileged to be on such premises, right? But it's only somebody who, you could say it's my castle, either because it's my house or because the owner lets me be here. Right, but a stranger, if I'm just coming, if I'm just a stranger and I see someone breaking into Vicky's house, I cannot interfere, according to the Talmud, I could. So is justified in using reasonable physical force upon another person when he or she reasonably believes it to be necessary to prevent or stop someone from criminally, criminally trespassing. Deadly force is reasonable only, one, to defend oneself for another. 
Two, when one reasonably believes deadly force is necessary to prevent an attempt by the, tr by the trespasser to commit arson or any violent crime. Or three, to the extent the person reasonably believes it necessary and only to prevent or terminate an unlawful entry by force into his or her, or her dwelling place of work. So very interesting. So, so um, number three is most interesting to us because number two is defending, defending yourself. You don't need the castle doctrine. Number two, um, to stop arson or other violent crime is related to the castle doctrine, but certainly three. Three says, I could stop you from entering my place of home, a place of work um, with deadly force if that's what I need to stop you from entering. Now, what's very interesting is, like I said, New York does not say it applies to the, to, to, to the place of work. Connecticut says it does. However, Connecticut doesn't make a differentiation of night or day, whether I'm going to be there. So that's where you see that, according to Maimonides, it makes a difference of what time of day it is. So basically, what I want to do is I want to um, make, do a quick do a quick summary of everything, and that hopefully that would be hopefully that would be um, some one, one, some form of some form of, of summary summary contrast secular law and Torah law. An intruder to kill an intruder to a place of business. So intruder to, um, intruder intruder to a place of business. According to secular law, in many states. There is no castle doctrine. Connecticut applies the castle doctrine to a place of business. What, is, what does the Torah say? At least according to the Rambam, Torah says place of business is covered. However, it has to be in the time. In other words, you could defend in a place of business. However, it has to be in a time where the intruder assumes that the business owner is there. So you break into a bakery at 12, 12 midnight, the bakeries that don't bake at night, then there's no castle doc. There's no. There's no law of tunneling in because even though it would apply to a place of business, but it, you have to be. The, it has to be in a case where there, with a where the thief assumes that the homeowner is there. Okay, who may kill the intruder? Secular law, secular law says only someone who lives in the property, excluding visitors. Visitors can also. Someone has to be permission to be there. What does Rambam say? Rambam says he's got nothing to do with who owns the property. It has to do with someone coming into your house. If I see someone coming into your house, I know he's putting you in danger. I know he's prepared to escalate. And therefore I, the stranger walking down the street, I can walk in and I can, I, and I can kill him. So again, like I said, we're starting from a point where they, these laws look similar, but because the under, philosophical underpinnings of the law are so different, the application is so different. Okay, what time of the day may the intruder be killed? According to secular law, any time. Castle doctrine applies any time. According to Maimonides, any time. According to the Ravid, only during, at night, not during the day. Can one kill a thief that we assume is only trying to commit burglary or arson and will not attack the homeowner? According to Castle Doctrine, absolutely yes. We said that in the law. We said, we, 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 we said, it, we said it clearly in number two. A guy comes to your house and says, I want to want to kill you. Leave. All I want to do is burn down your house. I don't like you. I want to burn down your house. According to Castle Doctrine, you could go and you could kill him. According to the Torah, fascinating, you cannot. Why? Because the only way you can kill is if you think he's going to kill you. So what happens if you know for sure? How do you know for sure is another question. But if I know for sure the guy doesn't want to kill me, let's say my father is coming to burn down my house, right? Ben Allah, father to son. We, we, know, we know he's not going to kill you, at least in most, most cases. In that case, according to the Torah, you cannot kill the person because your property is not more important than the other person's life. So it's, to me, it's just so fascinating how the law is, it seems so similar, but because the philosophical underpinnings are so different, the applications, they, 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 they uh, diverge dramatically. And then, of course, at the end, we just have the story. There was a famous story back in, in, in Israel in the early 2000s, I believe it was, where there was a rancher in the South, and the South is terrible crime, uh, terrible theft. And, and, and basically, this guy, this rancher, woke up in the middle of the night, heard noises. He went, went into his barn, and he killed two intruders who were Arabs. And he was arrested, and it became a whole to-do and it was a whole push, pushback. They were prosecuted. I think he was found guilty. Eventually, they changed the law, and they said, and that is exactly, they called the Shai Dromi, because that was his name. In that exact case, he would be allowed, he would not be guilty for killing the intruders. My point is that in that case, you can see how the handout, you can look at the, at the case. In that case, according to the Torah, he would not be able to kill 
First of all, they came into his barn at night. They did not assume he would be there. Number two, he killed them when, when they were running away. So according to the castle doctrine, it would have been okay. According to the Torah, it would not be okay. So just, I'm sorry that we had to go so fast. Really, we could, we, really we could sit on this for another, another hour, but I have five minutes left, four minutes left if you want to discuss and ask. But to me, this is just so interesting for, for on so many levels, but it's interesting because of its current, because we, we, we're dealing with this problem in America, unfortunately, so often, because we have so much crime, unfortunately. And we also deal with this, it's also interesting on the fact that something that seems, first of all, within the Talmudic system itself, how the post-Talmudic commentaries disagree dramatically on what the Talmud is saying. When the Talmud says the sun is not literal, when the sun shone upon him is it not literal, does it mean it's not literal or does it mean it's not only literal? Right, Rambam says it's not literal. Rivet says it's not only literal, but the literal limitation that you can't kill during the day, according to the Rivet, does apply. So it's interesting at looking at the Talmud itself. It's also interesting looking at it, comparing the Talmud to the secular law, law like I said, where just because it looks similar on the surface, it doesn't mean it's similar. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, thank you for joining. It's been a lot of fun for me. Now I got a little refresher. Last time I looked at this was 10 years ago or more. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful day. We'll see each other in good health. Stay cool and hydrated, please. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the moral of the story for, for, the, for the example that I wrote at the beginning, that they have to hire a security company. Yeah. And because he was unarmed, clearly. Right. He was, and, and the attacker was, uh, oh, was so pointing was the gun. Saying was pointing the gun at him. Yeah, this, if he had a gun for sure, you can kill him. But I'm just saying it's very interesting because I was a kid and somebody in, in Crown Heights, somebody would walk up to you and say, give me your bike. According to the Ravid, I can't kill him because maybe it's not premeditated. Maybe maybe somebody actually once did it to me for a joke. There was an older African-American kid who was my, within our block and he came up to me and he said, give me your bike. And I was frightened and I was gonna, and, and then he said, oh no, I'm just kidding. Right, so what am I going to do? Pull out my gun and shoot him? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's not according to the according to the Rambam. I can kill him. According to the Ravid, it's during the day. It's not necessarily premeditated. If the guy broke into your house and says, "Give me your bike," oh no, then 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 it's serious. So it's just it's just interesting. Yeah, Torah law pays more attention to the moral. Uh, right. Yeah. And, then, and again, the castle doctrine is a fine doctrine, but 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 the problem with the castle doctrine is that you're saying. In some sense, what you're saying is, is that my, my, my right to protect my castle comes before the criminal's life, which is, which is, which is a moral uh, uh, judgment. It's just the Torah would not agree with that moral judgment. Right. But in Shlomo's case, he clearly was protecting- Self-defense, yeah, self-defense, yeah. He, was, he wasn't armed against the, uh, an armed- uh... he could, If he would, was armed, if the guy comes to you and you have a knife and he has a knife and he comes to you with a knife, you can kill him. In other words, it's he not- he had a gun too, a gun in the neck. He pointed a gun at him. Correct. Well, my point is, you don't have to wait for him to draw the gun. That's the, that's the brilliance of Rava's point. You don't, have, if the, you don't have to wait for him to escalate. If you assume, if he did something to indicate that he's prepared to escalate, you don't have to wait for him to escalate. That's the, that's the, that's the catch here. Clear as day. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too.